Questo è partito. Ok. Ah, uh, well, that's a very general question. Um, I would say this is like the golden age of mechanical and kinetic art because you can now do things just amazingly cheaply and quickly that used to cost a quarter of a million dollars to do. So, you know, the tools are very cheap and they're very widespread and people are really exquisitely educated in technologies. Um, I think what's really happening in like 2016 and this decade that I had never seen before uh, is that Moore's law is finally not the driving force. There, there's, there's actual more cultural and regional influence in art production than there was in you know, earlier decades of, of tech art. You know, and, and the reason is that it was very difficult to do things quickly through digital methods. Um, but now they've just taken over music, they've taken over film, they're taking over sculpture even to some extent. And, um, they've infiltrated everything that they can. And they used to do it crudely and badly because there just wasn't enough processing power to do it. And now there's plenty. I mean, you could just, there's no drop of processing power, which is a new thing. <clears throat> well, I, I like to think historically, and I think, you know, if you look at Italian methods of production, I mean, traditionally Italians worry about it because they're sort of very good at small to medium enterprise style production and kind of lifestyle packaging. But they feel intimidated by like the speed of the Japanese or the size of the Chinese or the uh, financial power of the Americans. So commonly they feel hemmed in, um, you know, and, and even brain drained to an extent. So I don't have any illusions about the situation. I just think that what we have coming actually plays to Italian strengths. And there's, there's a period, there was a period when that was true. I mean, there was, there was a period when you were like Fiat against General Motors or you were Olivetti against Apple and IBM and you were really fighting overwhelming odds. But now I think that you know, the situation actually might play into the hands of like the Italian skills at like systematizing small to medium enterprises and kind of putting together projects quickly, getting large groups of people involved and kind of scattering in all directions, right? I mean, the actual means of production favor that, right? So um, I'm thinking that maybe they're just, the Italians are just going to flat luck out. I mean, it isn't, it isn't so much that they're, you know, sublime geniuses or anything. I mean, I happen to be an Italophile. I'm quite used to them by now. But I, I actually think that, like, objective factors are, are playing into their hands. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I've seen a lot of these kinds of think and do labs spring up all over the place. And, um, you know, I, I think it's kind of a contemporary cultural phenomenon. And I'm, I'm familiar with many of them. And, you know, they're, they're everywhere. I mean, they're in Berlin, they're in New York, they're in San Diego, where I was last month. They're, they're in Mexico. But, you know, they're particularly like all over Italy. I mean, Italy's just like got lots of hackerspaces and like dozens of fab labs. And they really didn't need to sort of be hit on the head with a stick to kind of pick up the fab lab or, you know, kind of makerspace ideology. On the contrary, it's not that different than like Achille Castiglione's studio in downtown Milan. I mean, if you go to the place, which I happen to have seen, because it's like downstairs from the offices of Wired Italia. <laughs> it, it looks very like a maker space. You know, he's just better educated and has better books, but you know, it has all the same kind of hardware experimental stuff. And you know, he, he's not, um, 
uh, you know, it's, it's not an industrial production space. It actually is a kind of testing lab where the guy is literally just, you know, applying his almost metaphysical approach to, to objects, right? So, you know, clearly that was suiting the temperament of Milan in the 70s and 80s. But then that was, you know, eclipsed by things like Walmart or Ikea, you know, which have these kind of gigantic continental scale operations that are very hard to, to, uh, to match, for Italy to match. Uh, but that's actually playing, it plays into the hands of the situation that exists now. I mean, if, I, if, you're, if you're in Italy and you're in a fab lab, you're actually on a more collegial level with people in academia or people in government or people in industrial production and somebody who's in like say a privately funded studio at the University of California, San Diego. And there's a lot of these places in the US now. And you know, I and I talk to people there, but they're they're very isolated. They don't really have a lot of social capital. And you know, commonly they're working on some kind of endowed fund situation. So they like come up with some kind of arcane engineering solution to some special thing and they publish it in their magazine and it kind of like goes nowhere, right? Um, unless it's picked up by a venture capital firm or you know it's somehow folded into somebody's business model. Okay, that's a very powerful way to do things. I mean, it's the Silicon Valley method, but I don't think that's the be all and end all. And on the contrary, I think that model is going to not collapse, but it's going to become old fashioned. I mean, basically you now have American industry consolidation and computers. It's just like the history of Detroit or the history of radio and television in the United States. So, you know, the big five of Detroit uh, where the big five, General Motors, Ford, Chrysler, et cetera, and the big five are computation or Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft. And they've just kind of like soaked up everything. Uh, but they haven't soaked up every possible thing because they're not actually very good at the things Italians are good at. Not very good at like lifestyle design, you know, kitchen products, clothing, fashion, they're, you know, they're but if you go and hang out with guys from Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft, Steve Jobs in particular, famous for wearing Armani suits. And it's like, they actually live in a rather Italian fashion. I mean, if you go hang out with the elite in these companies. They have Italian furniture. They, you know, they're drinking Barolo. You know. Yeah. You know, there isn't like, I don't know. The most challenging, well, you know, I, I think probably the most challenging problem in kind of technology arts uh, uh, or design art is like institutional continuity. Because the if you're messing a lot with technology or, you know, even if you're doing industrial design that has certain kinds of industrial base and the hardware goes away, it's very difficult to convey to younger people what this meant. Like, I wanted to write a history of augmented reality because it's, you know, about 30 years old. I mean, the term was like written in the 1990s. So I started collecting all these um, documents on various augmented reality experiments. And I realized it was very, very difficult just to describe in words what had been done. Right. So here's somebody in a lab and he's like come up with some kind of breakthrough. Um, so he, 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 he performs an, inter, an experimental setup that has like a certain set of components. But then even like six or eight weeks later, he like rips out some really important part and then like installs something else. So it's like, OK, the rig that he had was not stable. And then the things that he did with it were not stable. You know who he talked to. And you kind of know who was in the room and you can read the papers that he wrote about it, uh, you know, and, and quite commonly they're documented in an almost scientific fashion. But it's very difficult to explain to somebody just like what reel to reel mag tape was, 
if they've never seen it or what an acoustic modem was or why an acoustic modem should be important. You know, especially to somebody who's like 25, who's never seen an acoustic modem. Why would you trouble them with it, right? So, you know, you, you actually, um, you end up in this kind of uh, historical bog of technical minutia where you have to start using these kinds of sci almost science fictional rhetoric where you, you sort of hide the realities of what he was doing in some kind of some kind of haze, right? But that actually takes away from the nature of the guy's work because he wasn't really in there augmenting reality, even if it was an augmented reality guy. What he was usually doing was working on something like a, 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 program, a problem in, in registration, right? Like a technical problem in registration. And he actually, he's, he's now known as the guy who solved this particular issue because he like came up with an algorithm that was able to use reflective light shading off surfaces to sort of help you establish where the augment was going to be. But okay, I can describe stuff like that. I even understand it. It's just very difficult to write about it historically. And it's also very difficult to make it clear to people that what he was doing was really significant, right? So if you're doing something like you're writing art history, it's normally about things like, well, there was this guy and you know, he, he was Picasso and he was from Spain and he had some friends in Spain. And then he like made an important change. He decided to go to Paris. And then he like met this girl and you know, and then, and then he like did this stuff and then there's like this blue period, you know, and then he, and the other friends showed up and he started talking to Brock and Brock had these other ideas and they like had this meeting and Brock said this and Picasso said that. Okay, you don't go in there and say something like, you know, okay, Picasso used a lot of Prussian blue pigment during the blue period. And let me now explain how they mine Prussian blue pigment. Okay, it just doesn't come up, right? But in technology art, it's, it's super important. I mean, you can't overlook that. It actually is, is like, um, it's demolishing the guy's cultural achievement, you know, when you don't do that. So I, I worry about that because I see people kind of reinvent the wheel over and over again. You know, it's like things show up in regional scenes and they, they don't have a sense of continuity and they don't realize that they're like building on the work of, say, Nam June Pike, you know, very famous video artist. But he did all his work on cathode ray tubes and, you know, mostly videotape. So you can see like YouTube things that describe what Namju Pike was doing, but you don't really see Namju Pike's like relationship to the Sony company or, right? So, uh, you know, I, I, I am a technology art critic, but when I look at kind of standard art history and art criticism, I don't feel justice is done. Uh, well, I think there's a closer relationship between people who are doing science and people who are doing art. And I think it's a closer personal relationship. It's not a closer institutional relationship. Mm -hmm. Like, you can follow scientists on social media now and have a, uh, a much more intimate awareness of what they're up to than they used to be. I mean, you could be a famous Nobel Prize winner. And... People at your university would know what you were doing and your students would know and your colleagues would know. But, you know, a teenage girl in Lawrence, Kansas would not know. But now a teenage girl in Lawrence, Kansas, who happens to be your fan, can sort of like track what you're doing and, you know, and watch stuff. And, you know, also the, um, the mechanics of the popularization of science have broken down because science journalism has broken down. It used to be that you would be famous and the, but the press would have made you famous and the press would have decided what you were famous for. And then you would be, you know, Edison, the guy who invented the light bulb. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be Edison, the guy who tried to make rubber out of dandelions, but you did. You know, it spent a lot of money trying to make rubber out of dandelions. It's just nobody but a specialist would know that. But nowadays you actually, if you're following somebody like Edison, you actually see them blow up quite a lot. You know, it's just, like people, people would speculate about, say, the way Elon, what Elon Musk is doing in a way that they don't talk about what Edison was doing or, you know, what Henry Ford was doing. It's just a, 
a different set of social relationships. So in some ways it's more intimate, but in other ways it's also sort of more rumor mongering and somehow like more popular and kind of stupider because nobody's actually made the editorial decision about what it is that this guy does that is important. So, you know, I have, I have scientists in my family and engineers in my family. So I, you know, as a writer and an artist, I never had any trouble talking to engineers or scientists. On the contrary, I, I understood their problems in rather an intimate way. Um, but now I, you know, I, I, I sort of follow people in the science world with more of a sense of really emotional distress for what they go through than I ever felt before. You know, I feel sorry for them. You know, especially like climate scientists whose work has been very politicized, but also like bio scientists whose work are getting hassled or other scientists who like have to struggle between the academy and fundraising and trying to feed their graduate students. You're like, you're more aware of like, you know, just the, the kind of personal suffering and that kind of career choice. And in some ways that, that clouds your interest in what they're doing intellectually, right? It's like, oh man, Fred's really in for it this semester. It's not as good a thing to know as like, has met Fred made any progress in his understanding of the neutrino, right? Um, and also we are in just a society which is just panic stricken over making money from science and has very little interest in basic science. So as soon as anybody does anything, you know, the press and the public they always, always want to know who's going to cash in, right? Which is like a very alien thing for the scientific community to have to do. I mean, it's extremely counter to their values, right? I mean, nobody says, you're not supposed to say, we want to know how the sun shines because, you know, we can rent out the sun. Or, you know, we want to know how the wind blows because we can think we can charge people for oxygen. I mean, the fact that all this stuff is like, relentlessly commodified uh, and, and people are always looking for some commercial exploitation of it uh, is damaging to their ethos and I think it hurts their morale. And this especially has like penetrated all the research schools. It's like, okay, you're in chemistry. Do you have any patents? Okay, you're in engineering. You know, have, have you invented anything we can commercialize? Can you talk to the guys who are, you know, next door in our tech incubator? Okay, in some ways that's kind of useful and healthy. Because, you know, yeah, the academy should be involved in the community. But when, when your meal ticket is on the line, um, that's not a good situation. So, you know, I feel sorry for scientists. Uh, and I think that they have uh, lost a lot of cultural prestige that they had earlier in my youth. I mean, we're closer to them, but also we don't respect them as much. And uh, in, in some ways, the, uh, the prestige that was given to science is now given to venture capital, right? I mean, we, we talk about VCs with the way, with the respect we used to talk about people like Einstein. So do you think the tech utopia from the 70s and the 80s is a little bit disappointed nowadays? Well, you know, I was alive in the 70s and 80s, and I could promise you, I mean, there wasn't a lot of tech utopia around in my circles. On the contrary, we were all cyberpunks. We weren't dystopians. We were just relentlessly cynical and oppositional. And you know, I don't think that went away at all. Um, people are still cynical and oppositional. It's just that a lot of them have a ton of money. You know, um, I mean, a tech utopia would not have disruption. Utopias don't have disruption, right? Because in a utopia, all the problems are solved and basically history stops. It's an end of history situation because everything's great and we're all happy and we're well-fed and we just have nothing but leisure and things are great. Okay, nobody has that illusion. And, uh, you know, we commonly talk about, I mean, people in the computer world in particular were very aggressive. I mean, they really wanted to throw the established order on its, on its ear. And if you hung out with people in, in tech world, especially Silicon Valley in the 70s and 80s, and talked to them privately, they were full of hatred for IBM for AT&T, for, you know, for the music companies, uh, for television people. I mean, they, they really wanted to destroy them, right? And they, they felt that they were 
fat and stupid and in the way and had no right to exist and that they were crooked and, uh, you know, deserved to be annihilated. And that's pretty much what they did. I mean, they, they didn't always smile when they did it, but, you know, I mean, look what Apple did, to, what about Microsoft did to IBM, look what, you know, look what Apple did to the music industry, look what Amazon did to retail. I mean, they, they did disrupt. I mean, they, they were not warm and kindly and affirmative kind of industries. They were very aggressive, revolutionary almost. So um, that's how it was on the ground. And, and that's what I was seeing. And you know, I, I didn't go around telling people that things would be greater if everybody had a computer. I, I wanted everybody to have one because I knew that the people who had them were gonna be calling the shots. And if you didn't have one, you were gonna be disenfranchised. And yeah, I mean, that's true. But you know, the era that personal computer is over. People, people don't have personal computers. Now they have social computers, right? And just online. If you give a guy a personal computer and say, this is, here's your computer. This is just for you. Take it home, program. Nobody would do it. He's like, what? It doesn't have, there's no modem. You know, there's no, there's, yeah, there's no, there's no router. There's no Wi-Fi. It's just a computer for me. Why would I need that? Now, which, which is an interesting question because, you know, when I was telling people about that many years ago, that was the exact response that I got. Like a personal computer, what am I supposed to do with it? I, I don't compute. You know, I, I don't understand math or software. I was like, why, why would I want to do it? And now we're in a situation where it's kind of exactly the same. People just have these other devices. They have the mobiles and lozenges, but what they really have is relationships with Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, Instagram, Twitter, etc. They don't really sit around computing with these devices. So I, you know, I'm in a situation where I actually have to encourage people to think about personal computers again. And they won't be utopian, but I think it's very important not to lose the individual relationship to that technology. You don't you really don't want to be in a situation where your usage of a technology that potent is socially imposed on you, right? Um, so, you know, I, I, I expect, I don't think people understand this yet, but it's what the next decade will talk about. The post-internet world is going to be really interesting. And it's going to be interesting to see how much of the internet actually survives um, and my feeling is that it won't be destroyed by Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft. I think there'll be another version of it, maybe with another name, that's probably mostly military and academic. Because those are the original pre-dot-com internet players, right? And they're still around. I mean, the military's around and, you know, the academy's around. They're not what they were but they don't really want to be wings of Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft. It doesn't suit their institutional interests. And frankly, it doesn't suit mine either. I mean, you know, I, I don't really want to be a, you know, a content provider for Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, or Microsoft, even though I know I can't help it in some ways. You know? um, I don't feel contented with their, um, dominance of contemporary media. Uh, and I think I'll have a lot of friends because, you know, I, I think, but, you know, I've always been a, uh, a writer on cultural fringes. You know? uh, and I feel comfortable there. I mean, I, I will go to the fringe wherever the fringe is because I just, that's where I'm at home. Right? But I think I'm going to have a new kind of home. And I think people, people don't understand the, um, the radicality of this change, right? They don't, they don't understand what like a post Moore's law computational world looks like. And it, it's very different from, you know, the experience of the past couple of generations. I mean, Moore's law went on for 50 years and it was sort of propelling everything with this continual renewal of, you know, double the speed, double the storage, double the speed, double the bandwidth. And it's just gonna like go flat um, in a very surprising and sudden way. I mean, and you know, the, the wars are over there. I mean, Google, 
iPhone, it's basically about iPhone and Amazon, right? Um, and there, there probably won't be a new Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, or Microsoft. I don't think there's going to be a sudden company like Twitter that suddenly comes up and elbows their way because they, they become um, conglomerates, you know, they, they're, they're kind of pulling in. So I think, I mean, there's Huawei and there's the Chinese, you know, and the Russians might come up with something nationalistic to do something or other with. You know, and I, I don't count the Europeans out entirely there, but what's, what's going to happen there is the kind of industry consolidation that you saw in Detroit, and we're going to move into the chrome and tail fins period of popular computation, right? It's just they're big, they're plush, they're kind of pollute a lot, and, you know, they'll be like cars were in, in the 1950s. They're going to take on the aspects of American industrial design. And people aren't really aware of how big a social change that's going to be, right? Um, I can smell it coming, but I don't really have the words to describe it. I don't, I haven't like written a science fiction novel in a situation like that, for instance. Uh, but I have written some tracts about it, like uh, Epic Struggle of the Internet of Things. And um, I think a lot of people who are kind of in the Snowden Circle, for instance, are very aware of the dominance of Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft, but they're not aware that like the Wikipedia model is kind of dead in the water, or that you know peer-to-peer -peer sharing is basically Uber and kind of nothing else, right? I mean, they don't they don't understand that like these kinds of um, internet initiatives of the past 20 years, which like really had a big effect on people are just eclipsed by this kind of industrial consolidation that's, that's now happening. Um, but you know, I, I don't feel afraid of it because I lived in industrial consolidation. I don't know, but that's how I grew up. And I see it as part of a larger cycle. And um, I'm kind of thinking, you know, Maybe it's time to talk about something else besides computers. And, you know, and talking about art would be like a good thing to do, actually. You know, there are periods where talking about art matters a lot. Or talking about law or justice, right? And these are things that commonly people are really interested in. You know, and, it's like, and they're not boring times when people talk a lot about art or justice. They're not, they don't talk about software all the time. But, you know, maybe... Maybe we've just sort of exhausted our interest in that because we, we could push Moore's law farther if we wanted. It's, we haven't exhausted the technical potential to do it. It's just nobody buys it. Nobody, nobody wants faster chips, faster broad. They've got enough. I don't know. Yeah. So, you know, maybe we're glutted on it. We're not going to have a singularity. You know, we're having Detroit, not a singularity. Right? It's, it's the Detroit scenario. Okay, Detroit scenario, not the end of the world. In Italy, it wasn't the end of the world. Italy had fiat. I don't know. Uh, the McDonald's scenario wasn't the end of the world either. I mean, Italy doesn't like fast food that much. They've got slow food. Okay, I don't know. They've got Walmart. Walmart has not taken over Italian retail. You know, and on the kind of without the sort of uh, teeth of Moore's law to push it, there's actually more uh, of a uh, chance for Italians to reassert some of their own values and kind of say, well, wait a minute, since we're not talking about software, why don't we talk about something like culture, right? Or artworks or, you know, better design. And not like things that are designed at you, like say the Apple iPhone or iTunes, but things that are designed for you. Thank you, Ruth. Sure. Grazie. Good Thank luck with that. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, well.